Greetings. I'm Dr. Jason Ozuko from the psychology department at SUNY Geneseo, and welcome to the next video in our online PsychoPi class. In today's video, we're going to be continuing to build experiments. And in our last video, having demonstrated how to build a single loop experiment, today we're going to be building a double loop experiment. We're going to be building a memory experiment. So we've already seen how you can load in stimuli into a loop and have subjects make a response to those stimuli. But what if you want to load stimuli into one loop and then have some of those stimuli repeat in a second loop, perhaps intermixed with new stimuli? So I have gone ahead and created a new experiment in PsychoPy called Memory Experiment. And I'm going to go ahead and insert the basics. So if you have been watching my videos uh, so far, you'll know that I typically include a welcome screen. I'll typically include an end screen and then we'll have our uh, trial. However, I'm going to rename this as our study trial. And I'm going to insert a second routine called our test trial. And I'm going to also insert some uh, test instructions the subjects can get before the test uh, phase. And I'm going to surround these in loops. So I'm going to have um, a set of study trials, and we'll deal with all the parameters of those uh, of this loop in a minute. And then I'm going to insert a second loop over here called my test loop. And again, we'll deal with all the parameters of this loop in a moment. If you're following along, you should have a welcome screen, a study trial, test instructions, uh, test trials, and an end screen. On the welcome screen, I'm just going to go ahead and say welcome to our experiment with a text object. Uh, with an infinite duration welcome text and i will do the same with a keyboard response here just have a base response to move forward and we'll quickly set up our end screen um, so this should all be uh, ref a refresher participating uh, from our uh, previous videos if this looks foreign to you and i'm going through this too quickly Go take a look at some of the previous videos where we've built experiments. And here I'm just going to say um, my test. Get ready for the test. How about that? Get ready for the test. And we'll have a, a test key, which will be space. All right, there we go. So in our experiment, we're going to deal with words because they are the simplest uh, stimuli we can deal with. And so I'm going to have to create an Excel sheet in a moment to hold my stimuli, but let's map out what we're actually going to do in our experiment first. So in the study phase, what I would like to do is show six words to subjects. Um, we'll add an Excel sheet in a moment with six random words. And then at test, what I want to do is take those six words and mix in, let's say, three more words so that there are nine words uh, at the test. And I want subjects to make ratings in the test phase uh, to indicate which words they think they saw in the study phase and which words they think are new. And I not only want to have the words from the study phase included in the test phase, but I also want to score the accuracy so that I know if a word is indeed from the study phase um, and whether or not it is new. So let's start with the simplest idea you could put forth here. In your loops in PsychoPy, you can include an Excel file. So why don't we make two Excel files? We'll make one file for the uh, study phase, and we'll make one file for the test phase. And I will tell you right now, this is not how you should uh, set up your experiments, but I want to show you how this works, and then we'll go through how to do it slightly better. So opening up our study word Excel sheet, we can create a new variable here. Let's call it stim underscore word for the word stimulus that we're going to be showing. And just create six random words. So maybe uh, computer, mountain, hill, green, machine, and circle. Those are our six study words. We're going to be adding those as the Excel sheet for the study uh, trials. and while we're at it, why don't we open up our uh, test uh, Excel sheet, our test word Excel sheet, and let's copy and paste those six items into here and add three more. 
So I'm gonna highlight my study items and coming into my test Excel sheet, I'll paste them in. And then let's add Android button and country. So here are our three uh, new words. I'm gonna save this. So now both our study uh, word list and our test word list are two different Excel sheets one with six words, one with nine, but they both have the stim underscore word as the variable. So if we come into our study uh, trial loop, we can select an Excel sheet and we can select, uh, in this case, our study set. And notice that it detects that there are six conditions, so six words with one parameter, the stim underscore word. We want this entire loop to repeat only once because we want it to read through the sheet once. If we left it at five, then we would end up seeing these six words five times each. So we see 30 words, but with lots of repetition, we don't want that. We want our items read in randomly so that the six words come out in a random sequence. And these are trials. So this will just tell um, PsychoPy to log things as if they are trials. And the rest we can leave as a default. Next, coming into our test phase, uh, we're going to load in now our test words and we'll have it uh, repeat once. Notice that uh, this time we're getting a warning. This, the reason this is in red is it's just indicating that the stim underscore word uh, variable is being used in another list. And as long as that list is earlier or later in the experiment than our current list, that's fine. But if, for instance, this test trial loop existed within this study loop and they uh, both loops we're accessing Excel sheets that use this variable, then there'd be a conflict because you'd be trying to assign stim underscore word to two different values from two different Excel sheets at the same time. So if you see it in red, just be sure that your lists are separated on the timeline and one isn't, isn't embedded in the other and you'll be fine. Okay, so we can go ahead and click okay, even though we got that little warning. Now let's just go ahead and insert, because our study and our test trials are still blank, so let's go ahead and insert a text uh, component in each. So for my study trials, I'll let the uh, words just appear for one second, and I'll call this text study. And I want to access the stim word variable. So once again, again, this is review from earlier videos, but you're gonna put that dollar sign in front of the variable so that we access the variable and we don't just literally write stim word to the screen because that's what would happen without the dollar sign. And we have to remember to set this to every repeat. We set it to constant, then when the experiment begins, it looks for a variable called stim word, which doesn't exist until our loop actually begins. So every time this loop goes through a cycle, go ahead and uh, fill in stim word into this, this text object that we're creating. So there's going to uh, be our text uh, object. We could add a blank period, but I'm not gonna do that for right now. Uh, because we don't, it's not necessary for our testing purposes. Um, in the test phase, we're going to present our test word, which again is stim underscore word. We're going to have this set every repeat. This time we're going to have the duration be infinite because we'd like a keyboard response. And so we will also add a keyboard response. We'll call this key test. I think key test is actually used. So here's a case where you're going to get an error and you can't just get around it. Uh, so it says this name is in use by one of your components. Try another. If we go and we look at our test instructions, when I was setting this up, I had uh, my instructions and I had key test here. Uh, and this was just a space bar that I wanted subjects to press to get further in the experiment. So I'm just going to change that to key instructions. So we'll add in our key test. And we will add in, or we will allow it to, uh, we'll allow subjects to press yes or no. So basically what subjects are going to have to do is uh, on the test trial, for every word that they see, they're going to have to say yes if the word is from the study trial and no if the word is not from the study trial. This is what's called yes, no recognition in uh, memory research. Anyway, all right, we've got our basic experiment here. We can go ahead and give it a run. And let's see uh, how it works so far. So welcome to our experiment. And then we see our words, mountain, circle, computer, machine, green, hill. Get ready for our test. So was computer in the study list? We would say yes. Was green in the study list? We would say yes. Was country? We would say no. 
Mountain, yes. Machine, yes, I think. Circle, yes. Android, no. Hill, yes. Button, no. And that's our experiment so far. So, so far, so good. Um, let's take a quick look at our data file. And I already said you don't want to set your list up in this way where you're using separate Excel sheets. And there's other stuff that's missing in our experiment right now, which, um, you know, right now our experiment runs, but if we wanted to analyze this data, it would be a little messy. And so let me open up the data file and you can uh, see why, hopefully. So here's our data sheet, and we've looked at data sheets before, so this shouldn't be a surprise to you. But as a quick refresher, uh, you know, every column identifies a different variable, and every row represents a different time period in our experiment. You can see, for instance, the stim word variable took on different values. Here are the six uh, study trials in order, the order that we saw them. So we saw mountain, circle, computer, machine, green hill. And then later on, here are our uh, test trials. And so you can see the items that we saw and the order in which we saw them. Uh, scrolling over, you can even find the column that tells you which key I pressed on any given trial. And you can see my reaction time for each trial as well. So you could summarize this data easily yourself. However, uh, you should notice instantly that there is a problem. And the problem is this. We have no idea uh, during the test phase which words were actually old and which were new. Because, look, I'm saying yes and no to some items. I'm saying yes to some items, no to other items. But the question you're going to have when it comes to time to analyzing your data is, well, which items should he have pressed yes to and which items should he have pressed no to? And there's not really any column that is tracking this. Now, if you're particularly savvy, you could note that there's only six study items. And so when you could look at uh, the index of the test item, which is basically how far into the stimulus sheet, uh, you know, where was the test item? So this would be index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And you could realize that anything 6 or over was new. And so actually hidden in your data file is a bit of information uh, that, that tells you which items were old and which were new. So for instance, if we see a number in this column that's 6 or greater, like 8, this is a new item, and this is a new item, and this is a new item. So it is sometimes the case that even if you forget to log things properly in PsychoPy, you know, things might be, there might be sort of a variable that is indirectly logging what you need. However, I would not count on this. And really what we want is another column here that basically says old for items that came from the study phase and new for items that did not. Um, so we want a column that would look like this. So that in the test phase, for every item that's old, we can just check to see if people, if subjects responded yes, and for, subject, and for items that are new, we can check to see if subjects responded no. So how do we add this other variable to our experiment? Well, to do so, we have to go back to our stimulus sheets. And let's open up our test word sheet here. So we only had one parameter in our sheet, the stimulus word variable. However, we would like a few other parameters to code some other things. For instance, maybe we would like to co code the old new status as I just showed you. Well, I know that the first six uh, words are old. I know that uh, based on how I arranged the study list, these items are the old items and these items are the new items. So by simply including this extra column into uh, your stimulus sheet, if we now rerun the experiment here, the experiment is going to read in our Excel sheets once again, and the old new variable will be loaded up on every single test trial. Now, we don't have any routine that does anything with it, so we never show it on the screen, but it's going to be logged in our data file along with each word that is loaded. So let's run through our experiment real quick once again, and we can see this in action. So circle, I'm just gonna say yes and no randomly. So don't pay attention to my accuracy in the data file because it will be probably pretty poor. But uh, just to get a data file, 
Now I'm going to sort uh, my data by date modified so I get the most recent file at the top. So this is the data file that we just ran. I should start giving my, uh, my test runs participant numbers so we can see. Uh, I'm not giving any numbers. That's why it's blank and then just underscore. But anyway, going in here, you can now see, hey, look, that old new column is now being logged. So um, when you are creating your stimulus sheets, it's important to not just have the stimuli, but to also have other columns that categorize your stimuli uh, so that later on when you want to analyze your data, the proper tags are encoded into your data files. For instance, maybe we had um, you know, easy and hard words. Maybe we thought three of these words are easy to remember and three are hard. And so, you know, computer is easy, mountain is easy, hill is easy, green is hard, machine is hard, and circle is hard. And the new items, you know, they're uncategorized, let's say, so we can leave them as blank. Well, what we would see in our uh, data file when we looked at it um, is that not only would the old new column be here, but we'd have another column uh, called easy hard, and we would see, you know, easy hard, easy, easy, you know, I don't know if these labels match up to the right words, but the point is you would see this variable uh, sort of being logged into your uh, data. And so then for any particular trial, you could see did subjects respond yes or no correctly. And also maybe later on, you want to sort out the easy responses and the hard, because that's a manipulation in your experiment. Um, and so this would allow you to do so. So one of the most important things you can do when you are um, building your stimulus sheets is don't just include your stimuli, but include categorization uh, variables that help you figure out uh, later on in your data file uh, what condition certain uh, stimuli belong to. Okay, now let's say though that we also want our test trial to code the accuracy of our responses. We've seen the accuracy before when we built our Stroop experiment, uh, but let's do this again. So we would like our key response of yes and no to not just record the key that was pressed, but we'd also like to store the correct key. And we will call this, uh, let's say, yn underscore key, about that. So we'll have a variable called yn underscore key, and that will identify whether the response should have been a yes or a no. Now, we can actually put this variable right into our Excel sheet, the same way we did with our Stroop experiment way back when. And we can put yes for all the old items and no for all the new items. I can save my sheet. I can rerun my experiment. And now there's another variable that's getting loaded up on each trial with every word. Um, and this yes, no key variable, again, isn't being shown anywhere on the screen but it is being referred to in the code to identify which key uh, is right and which key is wrong. So again, I just sort of answered randomly there for speed. And I'm going to open up my most recent data file. And now you can see here's the key that should have been pressed. And here's the key that was pressed. And you can see now we have another column that is our key test correct. So it's actually coding. Uh, what key was pressed and what key should have been pressed. And if they line up, then you get a one. Otherwise, you get a zero. And I'm just going to hide these columns so we can see this a little more clearly. But here's uh, the key that should have been pressed. Here's the key that was pressed. And so you can see on this trial, this was a new item. And I said, yes, it was in the study phase. So that's incorrect. But here's a new item. And I said, no, it wasn't in the study phase. And that was, that was correct. So I got a one. So I get ones when my response matches what I should have responded to and zeros otherwise. Good, all right. Now, so far we have skirted past the issue of why you shouldn't have a separate study and a test uh, word list, but uh, let's address that right now. So the reason that you shouldn't have separate stimuli lists like this is it really opens you up to error. Let's say, then after a little pilot testing, you realize that uh, computer's not a good word. This should really be laptop. And mountain should really be cliff. And you say, okay, now this is the stimulus set we're going to go with. And you save it, and you close it, 
and you run your experiment and you collect all your good data and then you realize after you've collected your data crap i never went in and changed uh computer and mountain in the test list so my study list i changed uh, computer to laptop and mountain to cliff but i ran my entire experiment and collected all my data and in the test i had these items and technically these weren't seen so these should actually be new so i screwed up basically my study list my test list got out of sync so how can we avoid this error and how can we set our experiment up in a smarter way so that we don't make this error and Here's the truth. We don't need this study set. I'm just, in fact, I just deleted it. Didn't even give it a second thought. We don't need that uh, Excel list for our experiment. We can get by with the test list that we've got right here. And the way we can do it is by having the study set use the test list because all the words that we need are in the test list. But rather than showing all nine items, we're actually going to tell um, our experiment to only load the first six items for our study list. Because think about how we've arranged our test list here. The first six items are the study items. So if our study uh, loop is loading in this list and it's randomly selecting out of the first six items, then it's getting our study items. And by doing this, by making sure you're using the same list for the study and the test phase, you're decreasing the, the chance that you could make a mistake and you could somehow have your study and your test list be out of sync. Also, you know, as you're building up your stimuli sets, if you have multiple lists that have the same items, um, every time you make a change in one list, you have to make sure you're making it in all the others. Um, and it can become very tedious and time consuming. It's better to just have one list and have your experiment read that list in strategically. And so the way we get this list to only read in a subset of items is with this selected rows option. If you hover over the text input area um, of this option, you will see that it says, this allows you to select just a subset of rows from your condition file. So, uh, and it also warns you uh, as I have, that your first row is zero, not one, because again, it seems a little counterintuitive, but computers start counting at zero. So for instance, let's take a look at your uh, our stimulus sheet here again. So here are our words, and we want to load in the first six. So laptop will be item zero, cliff will be item one, hill will be item two, green item three, machine item four, and uh, circle item five. So in order to load these items, if I put selected rows zero, then my study trials would run and they would simply load laptop. I would always see laptop because I'm just looking at one item. So if I wanna look at a range of items, the way I indicate that is the first number is the first item, so item zero. Then I put a colon and then I indicate one past the last item. So uh, in this case, because I want to load six items, last item is five, so I actually indicate six. And this will load in the first six items. It's a little funky how computers count, I know, but just remember, the first item that's available to you is always zero, and when you are specifying a range, you always uh, provide one number past the number you actually want. So I want zero, one, two, three, four, five, so I indicate zero colon six, and this will grab the first uh, six items. Um, one way that it kind of makes sense to count one pass where you want to end is because you started counting at zero, you can just think you add one to the final number. Um, I don't know if that helps or not, but you can see now we're loading in our three or our six words. I'm getting all tongue twisted with the, uh, the numbers here. But we load in six words at study, nine at test. And we can go ahead and we can look into our data file. And we can see that we have six items at study. We have nine items at test. And everything works. The last issue that we will look at today is how you can get a little fancier with checking the accuracy of your responses. And for instance, how you can provide uh, feedback. So let's go ahead and insert one more routine here, and we will call this 
test feedback. And I'm going to insert it after the test trial. And we're going to also go into our test word Excel sheet. And I'm going to delete this yes, no key column. Because you know what? We can code that ourselves. So we have two things we now need to address to finalize our experiment. First is our keyboard routine is still going to be expecting there to be a yes, no variable that tells us which key uh, should have been pressed. So we're going to have to figure out how to compute or, or calculate this yes, no variable um, so that we can still calculate accuracy automatically. And we also want to present feedback to subjects. We're going to do both of these things by inserting a very little bit of code. So if you didn't watch the advanced video that came with the Stroop uh, experiment, the previous video, then you know code is going to seem a little novel to you. But today, we're just going to keep it very simple. You can go back and watch the previous video if you want a deeper dive into how coding works. But basically, if you go into uh, the components area and insert uh, under custom, you can select a code object. And we'll call this the key or the code test uh, code. And in code objects, you have various tabs that tell you where you want to insert the code. For us, we want this to code to uh, occur at the beginning of this routine, meaning at the beginning of our test trials loop every single time the uh, test trials loop loops. And in code, you can access other variables. So for instance, there was the old new variable that we know is going to be coming out of our Excel sheet. And this will, old new variable will be equal to old uh, for trials that are old and new for trials that are new. And we know that when a trial is old, then our yes, no uh, key variable should be equal to yes. And we know that when old new is equal to new, then our yes, no uh, key variable should be no. So we just have to write this a little more formally. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with how to write Python code, you might want to go look up a few really basic tutorials. But if you're familiar with computer coding at all, it's pretty simple. So we're going to use two very simple if statements here. So if uh, old new is equal to old, and when you're doing a comparison within an if uh, statement, you need to put two equal signs. In coding, a single equal sign means uh, take this variable old new and make it equal to old. Um, if you have two equal signs, then it means check to see if old new is equal to this value old. So equal is being used in two ways. This is make old new equal to old. And this is, is old new equal to old? A little, little subtle difference. But again, if you're not, not following what I said too clearly, um, you might want to go and look up a few really basic uh, Python introduction uh, programming videos. And they'll sort of catch you up on some of the basics. Um, so here's my first statement. And this happens at the beginning of my test trials uh, loop. It checks to see if the old new variable, which we know is be has already been loaded in from our Excel sheet, is equal to old, then the yes, no key variable is equal to yes. Otherwise, the yes, no key variable can be equal to no. So this is it. This is all we need. Uh, and so this will check if our old new uh, status is old or new and assign yes, no key. So this will programmatically figure out which key subjects should be pressing. Uh, so very simple. That's the first bit of code that is being thrust on you. The other bit of code um, that we can uh, affect is in our, our feedback area. The other bit of code that we will be setting up is in our feedback area. And actually, I'm just going to move this code to the top. I right-clicked on it and selected Move to Top. If you're not sure why I did that, again, my previous video uh, covers uh, in a bit more detail about how ordering these items is important. Um, OK, let's start with a bit of code. And then we'll add a text object afterwards. And again, this code is going to uh, be inserted at the beginning of the routine. And we'll call this feed our feedback code. And what I would like to do is check to see if subjects got the previous trial right or wrong, and then say congratulations, or else say, you know, you made a mistake. So we need to check their accuracy. I've opened up a data file here because I want to show you guys something. 
The column names that are listed up here are actually variable names from PsychoPy. So remember that we had a column that was scoring accuracy. It was called keytest.core. So I haven't bothered to look anything up in the PsychoPy documentation at the moment. Let's imagine I'm just sort of trying to hack together my experiment, figure it out. I could say, I wonder if I could check the value of this variable. And when it is equal to one, they got the, the trial correct. And when it's equal to zero, they got it wrong. So let's try that. So if keytest.core is equal to one, then uh, let's say feedback underscore text equals congratulations, um, you got it right. We'll put a lot of exclamation marks to really encourage our subjects. Now we could say else, um, you know, feedback.text is equal to, um, sorry, you got it wrong. We'll put a frowny face so that our subjects understand we're sympathetic. Um, you could just use a simple else. I'm going to throw one more little uh, code element at you, and that is the else if statement. And let me write it out and I'll explain what's happening. Our code is doing this. It's first checking to see if uh, the key test dot correct, so the variable that's tracking if subjects were correct, is equal to one. If it is equal to one, then the feedback that we're, we're preparing, this feedback text variable, says, congratulations, you got it right. If this isn't equal to one, then we check to see if it's equal to zero. So in our case, because this can only be equal to one or zero, this, as I've got it written, is equivalent to this. There's no real difference. But I wanted to show you that there's kind of two things you can do if an if statement fails. You can just say, okay, in all other cases, do this other thing. Or you can say, okay, well, check a different case. And in this case, do something else. And you can chain these even further. You know, you could say, else if key test dot correct is equal to two, maybe two is a possibility. You can say uh, you know, feedback underscore text. Whoa, how did you get a two? Uh, because that should be impossible. And then you can say else. And so you can have a, a chain of these if statements um, where you provide a series of different possibilities for what the computer should do in different circumstances. For us, again, we know that this variable can only be equal to one or zero, so it will never be equal to two, so this will never occur, and we don't need a catch-all condition of uh, if it's not equal to one, it's not equal to zero, and it's not equal to two, then do this because it's going to be equal to one or zero. So we can just leave it uh, as is, as I've got it right now, and I can click uh, OK. Um, now, the last thing that I need to do is include a text object to show the feedback underscore text variable. And again, make sure to put a dollar sign in front of your variable names when you're inputting them into fields here. I'm gonna have the feedback up here for two seconds just to give us a bit of time to read it. And don't forget to change this to either set every repeat or set every frame. If you leave it as constant, when the experiment starts, it tries to set up this text object, even though it's well far into the timeline, it will try and set it up at the beginning of the experiment and feedback.text doesn't even exist until we get to this code, which runs after our first test trial uh, has already been responded to. So you'll get an error if you don't um, if you don't change this to set every repeat. So feedback underscore text, and I think I said two seconds. Cool. So we can go ahead and click run, and we'll see our experiment. Uh, one more time here. So welcome to the experiment. Here are the words. And country, I think yes. Sorry, you got it wrong. I guess I was wrong. Cliff, I think yes. Congratulations, you got it right. Uh, machine is yes. I'm going to make a mistake here. I'm going to say no to this. So you can see that we're now getting feedback based on our responses. 
Um, and I want to show you two other small things, actually. I'm going to exit the experiment early. Um, in our code here, we're providing feedback text. It's all on one line. Uh, what if I wanted it to say, congratulations, and then enter, enter, you got it right? You can actually do this by simply using a special character of backslash n. This counts as pressing enter. So even though this is written as congratulations slash n slash n, the computer will swap these slash n's out and press enter. And so it will say congratulations on one line, then two lines down, it will say you got it right. And we can do the same thing with you got it wrong. The one other thing I wanted to show you is that we can actually have embedded if statements and maybe we want a different feedback message for old and new items. So if old new is equal to old, then we could say, and notice that I'm indenting things as I go. Again, if you're not familiar with how Python works, you're going to have to go watch a really basic tutorial on it. Um, and I talked about this a little bit in my previous video, so even my video could probably catch you up, but you do have to watch your indenting and spacing with Python. Um, indenting means that this code exists within this sort of code's block. Um, and again, you'll have to go check a video if you're not sure exactly what that means. But here's what I'm doing. I'm going to have different error messages if things are old versus if things are new. So when old new is old, if a subject responds correctly, um, I will say, congratulations, it was old and you knew. And if they are incorrect, I'll say, sorry, the word was old. On the other hand, if old new is not equal to old, so in this case, it's equal to new, meaning these is for, this is for the new items, let's have a different set of feedback messages. So for a new item, if you get it right, we'll say, congratulations, you didn't get fooled. And on the other hand, if the item, if they uh, got it wrong, meaning it was a new item, and they said it was old, we're going to say, sorry, um, but that was a new item. So you can create these embedded uh, sort of if statement chains in order to provide more specific feedback to people uh, based on their responses. And keep in mind, you could do more things in these if statements than just produce feedback. You could have some sort of variable that tracks uh, if this is a hit or a false alarm, uh, for instance. So in memory research, a hit is when you call an old item old. False alarm is when you call a new item uh, old. I'm a memory researcher and I had to pause for a second there. Um, so. Let's do one more thing. I know we're adding a lot in this code, but uh, just in the interest of showing you everything that's possible, I, I really want to try and be thorough here. Let's have an item status uh, variable that starts just as nothing. Um, and let's go ahead and code it here based on the response category. So item status is equal to a hit when it's an old item and they've called it old. When it's an old item and they've called it new, that's called a miss. When it's a new item and they've called it new, so they're correct, this is called a correct rejection. And when it's a new item and they're incorrect, so they call it old, this is called a false alarm. These labels, by the way, again, are coming from memory research. So an old item that is called old is a hit, an old item that is called new is a miss. A new item that is called new is a correct rejection, and a new item that's called old is a false alarm. If you're unfamiliar with those terms, that's okay. You know, you might not be a memory researcher, but if you're just wondering where those terms came from, you know, I'm not just making them up. They do come from uh, memory research. And now I have a variable called item status that is categorizing my items for me as subjects respond. And I might actually want to say log this item. So maybe at the end here, um, I call a function that will log item status to my, uh, to my data file. So again, this was covered in my previous video, but if you skipped past the advanced video or you just started here, maybe this is the first video you found with me. Um, whenever you create a custom variable in PsychoPy, it doesn't automatically end up in your data sheet. 
So feedback.txt is not going to appear in the data sheet anywhere. Item status won't appear in the data sheet unless we use this special function called uh, it's this experiment.addData. Then you give the name that you want to appear in your data sheet. I'm just using item status, but I could call it whatever I want. I could say uh, item stat or something, and that will appear in the column. Uh, I'm going to leave it as item status because I think that's a fine enough name. And the value that I want to log is the value that's equal um, to this variable here. So I've categorized my item and I want that logged in um, to my data sheet. So a couple of things changed. We're going to see different feedback and our data sheet is actually going to log item status for us. Let's run our experiment one more time and see that all in action. Uh, and then we can uh, wrap up here today. So welcome to the experiment. Our six words cycle through. And once they finish, I can say yes. Sorry, but that was a new item. So that was a false alarm I just made. Let's see. That was a hit. That was a hit. I have a miss here. Uh, that was a miss. Uh, that's a correct rejection because I saw that was a new item. I said no. Okay. So I'm just going to start responding randomly. Do these items. Okay, experiment over. And let's look at our data sheet one more time. So here we go. So here's our items. And if we scroll over, we can not only see um, what key was pressed, we can see if it was correct or incorrect. Uh, notice, by the way, that previously the yes no key uh, column was being stored because we wrote it into. Um, our stimulus sheet, but that is doesn't exist anymore, so it doesn't get logged. And think about what I just said. If you don't use this function to save a custom variable, it doesn't end up in your stimulus sheet. We didn't log the yes no underscore key variable that is being that has been calculated here. We calculate it, but we don't log it, and so we don't have a column that shows us what the correct key was. So there's, you know, the opposite of what I was just trying to show you guys that you can log a variable. There's where a variable doesn't get logged. Now it doesn't matter for us because we can see the consequence, whether it was correct or incorrect, but maybe here you did want the yes, no key to actually be logged. So you would need to come in here and you would need to use this experiment add data and we could call it the yes, no key and log it like that. Um, or we could call it, you know, the correct key. Again, whatever is in these quotes here, um, single or double quotes can be used in, in Python, by the way. Notice sometimes I'm using single, sometimes double, just to have it when you code in Python to not be super picky. Um, but you can call it whatever you want, and then this is just what value you should log, and it's the value of the variable. So this would add a correct key column back into our data sheet for us. Um, but the more interesting thing for us is now we now have an item status variable in our data sheet, and uh, I think our, if I'm remembering our first four trials, because I paid attention to those at least, we had a false alarm, a hit, a hit, and a miss. Um, and that's what we've got here. So yeah, you can categorize variables, do all sorts of stuff, um, and log whatever you'd like. And one last thing, you know, you may be wondering, you know, what is the point of actually calculating out the yes, no response? And then having to add an extra line to manually log it into the data file if you could just put it into your stimulus sheet, right? I mean, why not do it like this? Oops. Uh, why not have that in your data sheet? And again, I would argue that it comes down to potentials for errors. You know, if an RA is updating your data sheet and they accidentally do this and nobody catches it, then this is a new item that will be coded as if it was an old item in terms of the expected response. So you've got an error in your sheet, and unless you catch that, you're never going to know. By having things set up like this, as long as you, you just have to focus on getting the old new column right, and other than that, everything else will flow deterministically from that. So it just sort of reduces the chance of errors, and I would say whenever you can, whenever you're programming your experiments, because your experiments are not going to be as simple as this test case, do everything you can to avoid the opportunity for error. And if it's having the computer check to see which condition things are, 
Have the computer do the check. I mean, that's the kinds of things that computers are good at. Computers are good at menial, redundant uh, checks. And so build those into your code rather than relying on uh, building your stimulus sheets correctly. And that will reduce your opportunity for error in your data. And that about wraps us up for today. So in the following videos, we are going to be looking at some more advanced things that you can do with loops, including uh, loading stimuli from a larger uh, pool of stimuli and shuffling stimuli across subjects. In today's video, uh, the same six items always ended up being the study items and the same three always ended up being the new items. Uh, one of the things we'll look at in upcoming videos is how do you shuffle those items so that uh, every subject gets a different potentially set of study and test items. We'll also look at practice loops and how to look things up, look up responses from uh, earlier loops in later loops. Uh, but as far as today goes, if you haven't subscribed already to the channel, please make sure to do so. And if you are in need of some PsychoPy help, I actually offer consulting and programming services, the details of which are provided in the description below. If you do need help, uh, please look me up. Other than that, I will catch you in the next one. Thanks, guys.